Now we have Zaz talking about lock picking, and maybe some of you can try out yourselves. Thank you. Um, so basically, we uh, you know we gave the intro um, the day before yesterday, and uh, was just concerned pin tumbler locks. So um, these ones that we covered. Uh, two days ago that are in most locks that you encounter in, in the day, in doorknobs, uh, in padlocks, um, in deadbolts, and so on. Uh, and so we, we went through all this kind of like cutaway view and stuff like that. So just quickly, is there anyone here, um, just show of hands, is there anyone here who wasn't here two days ago that wants to see a quick rundown of the pin tumbler locks? So keep your hands up if you would like to see that. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll run through this quickly because um, these are like the locks that people generally pick at these lock picking workshops. So if you cut off the face um, of the pin tumbler lock, um, you can see that there's, um, it's called a pin tumbler because the, um, those things that are vertically in, in uh, red and blue there are pins, spherical, you know, mostly spherical pins of metal. Um, and the tumbler uh, means that they move into place and allow something to rotate. So that uh, the, the darker yellow part is called the plug, uh, and that will rotate when the pins, the gap between those two pins lines up on the edge of the plug. So here's what happens if you try to open it without a key. Um, uh, wait. Some of these videos you have to press and some you don't, but yeah, so you can see trying to turn this, the blue pin blocks the plug from turning, right? Um, and I actually made a laser cut cutaway here as well, so you can just you play with this, but um, if I try to rotate the blue thing, it's, it's hard to do. It won't move, right, because the yellow one's blocking it, and then if Norbit picks the lock so that it lines up, then this now rotates and the lock opens. So you guys can play around with this to get the idea. Um, and the spring, of course, on the top keeps everything pushed back down. So if you open it with a key, um, the key goes in, and the key's cut so it exactly raises it to the right position, and the lock rotates. Obviously, in a real lock, you have more than one pin. Um, otherwise, it would be super easy to pick it open. And so the pins stack behind each other like this. And when the key comes in, um, that's what all those different depths of cut are on the key. It lines everything up, and then the lock can turn. And when you pull it out again, the springs push everything back down so that someone can't come right after you opened it and, and try and open the key again, uh, open the lock again. Um, sometimes you'll notice when, when you're using your real keys on a lock, they'll start to get sticky, and the, and the, key, and the lock won't work that well. That's usually because uh, your key is worn down a little bit, and even just one, what's called bitting. Um, the, uh, the bitting refers to the depth of cut at each position along the key, um, and th they come in standard amounts. Um, so I think, from memory, one bitting in a Schlage key is something like 15 thousandths of an inch, um, which is like, I don't know, 500 centimeters or something like that. I'm, I'm joking. I just talk, I'm joking about how crazy American things are. But 0 0.015 of an inch. Um, there's 2.54 uh, centimeters to an inch, or 25.4 millimeters to an inch. So you guys can do the conversion. But it's a small amount. But it's a standard amount. So you, your um, your pin stacks, your pin biddings actually have a code, a number code to them. So if you know the code of a key, you can go to a locksmith and say, I like this key cut to code, and it'll be basically one number per bidding, um, or one number per pin stack of the, of the lock, uh, and that number refers to how deep the key is cut. Um, similarly, if you have one bidding too high at that pin, now the bottom pin is blocking the lock from turning, and the key also does not work. Um, in a perfect world, everything would be exactly aligned uh, vertically on those holes where the pins are fitting into, and if you tried to turn the lock, um, this should be an animation here, if you tried to turn the lock while it was closed, all those pins would stick at the same time, 
right? So you're sticking something in that's not a key, trying to turn it, all those pins stick. Uh, and you wouldn't get any information from turning the, key, turning the lock without the key. But in the real world, things aren't so clean and neat. Uh, and they, you know, these plugs are just a brass thing that's a, that they've, a machine has drilled holes into. And the machine doesn't have everything aligned 100% perfectly. Similarly, the pins can be damaged. Uh, they're just little slugs of brass. Uh, brass is a soft metal, so it gets easily scratched and damaged. Um, and so when you turn a lock without the key, um, usually just one or maybe one or two pins sticks and binds. So um, if you apply tension to the lock, trying to turn it, and then find that key that's sticking and move it up and down, you can actually set it. So um, when this So we've, we've put some tension on the lock, it's kind of sticking, we're forcing it up, and then the plug turns a little bit. And at that point, the spring can't push that top pin back down again. So watching it again, it comes up, plug turns a little bit, and now that, that pin is set in place. And the bottom pin, uh, called the key pin, because that's the one that touches the key, um, it can still move, it becomes loose. And so it can, it'll just drop back down with gravity. And so now, if you've done that to one pin, you can do it to multiple pins, and you can pick the lock one pin at a time. So the, the L-shaped thing that's going in there now is called the tension wrench, or the torque wrench, and that's what's being used to turn the plug to make the, to make the, the pins bind. And now the pick that's being inserted in there is called a hook pick. And the lock picker is feeling those pins one by one to find the one that's sticking. And as soon as that sticks and the plug turns a little bit, now a different pin binds. And the lock picker finds that one as well. And one by one, going through them until all the pins are set and the lock will open. Uh, so the lock picker can, can test a previously set pin. You can feel that the, that that bottom pin is just floppy. There's no spring resistance on it anymore. And that's the last one. Boom, and the lock opens. So that's the sort of one by one pin, pin tumbler lock picking method. You do have to be careful here because there's enough space in those spring area up the top um, and uh, who's, who's got the laser cut model? Hold, hold that up. Yeah, hold that up for people and show that you can push both those pins all the way up into the spring area, right? And then there's no way the lock is going to open because you're blocking it with the bottom pin. So that's called overlifting. You can see it in the animation there. Um, and it will stick because you're putting tension on the lock. You're trying to turn the lock. The, the, top, the bottom pin will stick and then there's no way the lock is gonna open. So if you get into that situation, that's very common when you're picking, you just release the tension a little bit on the, on the plug and you'll hear click, 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 the, the set pins pop back down again and then you start again. Um, so that pick that you saw there is a, a common hook pick. Uh, we also have pins called rakes um, and a rake is a wiggly pick that lets you sort of go back and forth and flip pins up and down uh, at different amounts. Um, here's the animation here. And the idea here basically is just to wiggle all the pins crazily, almost at random, until they all line up and set like that. So some locks are very vulnerable to raking. Padlocks, like, like without security pins, just your basic bad master padlocks and stuff like that, they respond very well to raking. You can usually open them, open them really quickly. Um, the half diamond is the tool in the middle here between the hook and the rake. And that's a very useful pick uh, because you can do a lot of things with it. You can lift individual pins just like you would with a hook. Um, you can slide it in backwards and forwards and do raking and shoveling. Um, you d so you don't, the drawback using a single uh, half diamond as a rake is that you don't move the pins next to the 
main one. Sometimes it's good to sort of like be trying to line them all up at once, but you can do it. Uh, it sometimes works. And then you can flip it over and use the flat side to count how many pins, because it's, you know, before you start picking, you might want to know how many pins you're dealing with. So you put it in, uh, lift everything up, and then pull the, uh, pull the half diamond out a pin at a time and you'll hear them snap down one by one and you'll be able to count the pins. Um, so as we can see from this diagram, again, we're using two tools for picking. We're turning the lock with the tension tool and we're picking with the pick. Um, so a big part of the technique and the skill is um, putting the right amount of pressure on the turning tool. So in general, it's recommended not to use your thumb and pull it. Instead, put your fingers over the lock and push the tool because your fingers typically have more sensitivity and more uh, dexterity than your thumb. Um, and even better, push all the way out at the tip because that way you have very, very fine control over the amount of tension that you put on the tool. Um, you can, you know, when you're starting out, it's hard to know how much pressure is a, is a good amount of pressure. So a, uh, a rule of thumb, no pun intended, is uh, to sort of just look at the color of your fingertip when you're pushing the tension tool. So this is good tool pressure. Your, your finger still mostly has blood flow in it. Um, if it's turning white, you're pushing too hard. Um, typically, you know, with most of the beginner lock, lock pick sets, you'll turn by the edge of the plug. So you'll put the tension tool in where the, uh, the keyway is fattest and where you're not blocking your pick access to the pins. So you're turning sort of at the edge there um, and your turning tools will look like something like this. Um, sometimes you have double-ended ones uh, that stick more or less into the keyway, um, depending on how you feel. And all, all this is about how much space you have to work, you know, because this thing, it's applying the, t the tension that you want, but it's also taking up space. It's getting in the way. So if you have it down there at the bottom of the keyway, you've got about this much space to get your pick in and attack the pins. That's usually OK. Um, one thing to watch out for is to uh, jam it against the bottom um, of, the, of the keyway, against the plug. It's not what you want. Uh, it's, you're not at the most rotationally advantageous place down there at the bottom. Um, so you're already, if the, especially if it's an old lock and things are a bit wobbly, you can kind of have things bind up and get jammed. So just be careful not to put too much friction there. You can also get these flat turning tools, uh, which allow you to turn from the center of the plug. So now that's the sort of the most mechanically advantageous place to turn and spin the plug, but that also blocks the front of the keyway. Now you've got to get your pick in underneath um, and reach around that tension tool to pick the pins. Um, and then which way should you turn? Uh, it depends on the lock. So the standard crappy padlocks usually go clockwise. Um, these uh, doorknobs often go counterclockwise unless they're a Schlage. Um, and if it's a deadbolt, it can go either way depending on which side of the door it's mounted on because doors can open on either side and Usually the me mechanical action of turning the key retracts the deadbolt, so it's installed whichever side that you want to go. Um, so that's the sort of like quick intro to the uh, pin tumbler stuff um, that we did the other day. The most important things are number one, relax. If you're really you know, tense and you're grabbing everything tight, uh, it's harder to sort of feel the fine imperfections in the lock and uh, what's going on in there. It's a, it's a very sort of zen activity. So you want to relax. And secondly, when you get one open, let everyone know about it. Call out open. Um, so that's sort of like what we covered two days ago, very beginning. And then we said, everyone come grab some picks, pick some locks. Uh, but, and that's, you know, that's, that's the standard sort of intro lock picking stuff. But um, we had a lot of questions over the past couple of days about other kinds of locks, especially we have some other kinds of locks that people were picking them up and they're like, oh, how come this isn't working the way you said? Because uh, it's different kinds of locks. So another very common type of lock is a wafer lock. Um, and you encounter these all the time. Uh, they're mostly 
used in like cabinets and stuff like that. I think I've got some slides here. But uh, looking inside the wafer lock, um, you got, uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a, a wafer is, it just means like a thin thing of something. Like if you, the, uh, uh, the Matter Lab over from, from Vienna has some edible wafers over at their desk in the, in the area over there. Um, delicious. But in this case, it refers to the fact that instead of pins, instead of these spherical pieces of metal, we've got flat pieces of metal that are having to be lifted up uh, to get into the right place. So here's what it looks like from the outside. The yellow again is the plug, and the red in this case is the wafer. And if we take off that front of the plug and look in further, we see what a wafer looks like. So it's this kind of oval-shaped piece of metal with two little tabs at either end, and then the center is square, and that's to allow the key to pass through it. And so here's what happens when you put your key in, um, and it raises it to the right height. So in this animation, it's starting off locked, can't turn because of the bottom. If you lift it too high, it's also locked, but if it's just right, it can turn. And so that's what the, what the key is, the key at that position has a height that's just right to get that wafer in the right place. So you'll encounter wafer locks on filing cabinets, um, electrical panels, uh, and all kinds of things like that. They're, they're su obviously super cheap to make because it's all just these stamped, cut out pieces of metal, um, cheaper, than, cheaper than little cylindrical pins. Uh, you also encounter uh, wafer locks a lot on like ca on car doors, but they're better quality wafer locks. Um, so that's a that's the uh, wafer lock thing. Um, you can p we have some wafer lock picks here, um, although we don't really know how to use them that well. But you can play around with them uh, and and see how you go. Next up, uh, combination locks, and so this is. Uh, I don't know if the person is here, but someone was asking me how to crack a, uh, how to, they brought along their own combination lock, and they're like, I forgot the combination for this. How do we open it? So it was like, cool, um, we've, got a, we've got a project. So this is, this is not exactly the one that he had, um, but this is one, the most common one, the master combination lock. They're everywhere, especially like when you're in high school in the United States, um, you have a gym locker, and everyone gets one of these combination locks because you know kids lose keys, but at least they can write the combination down somewhere and they're not gonna forget how to get into their locker. Um, but these are not good locks. So if you're putting this lock on your, on your locker, uh, what you're really saying is just like, please don't open this locker because it's not gonna stop anyone who knows what they're doing. Uh, and that's because these locks are extreme, uh, incredibly vulnerable to a, uh, a shimming attack. So these are what's called padlock shims. We have some of these too. In fact, that's how we opened this guy's lock earlier, an hour or so ago. Um, and they are very thin but strong pieces of metal that you slide down the side of the um, lock hasp, or the, the, the shackle, uh, and it just disengages the latch and it opens right up. So it slides down there and what you can see in that there is you can see that that shackle only has a little kind of piece cut out of it where the catch impacts and so you're just sliding down in there and you're pushing that catch out of the way and popping out the padlock shackle. It's super easy, once you get good at it, um, you know, it takes you like 10 or 20 seconds maybe. Um, for the lock we did earlier, it took, it took me a little longer because I was used to master locks where the, sh where the catch is on the left hand side but his lock it was on the right-hand side. So tr tried a little bit, wasn't working, switched it over, and it opened. Um, you can make padlock shims yourself. They you can buy nice ones made out of like high-quality steel, and they'll last a few times. But if you only want to use it once, you can make it out of the side of an aluminum drink can. So what you do is you cut out a piece of your can, and um, yeah. So <laughs> once, you, once you're finished with the beer, don't, don't do it before the beer is out of the can. But then you, you cut off a piece like this and you mark it in a grid and that shows you where to cut. You cut it out into this kind of an M shape and then fold the top over uh, and then fold the sides back over the, over the edges uh, like this. 
until you have something that looks like that. And so now that top is like kind of strong and easy to hold onto, um, even though sooner or later everyone cuts themselves with padlock shims. They're pretty sharp. So you just have to accept that you're gonna hurt yourself at some point. Um, and then you wrap it around a ballpoint pen to get the shape. And there you go. Um, so here's just a short couple of slides of opening one with the beer can. And sometimes you need to move the dial a little bit, as you can see here, because the dial sometimes blocks um, the uh, release mechanism. But then eventually, boom, it's open. And whoever made these slides, because once, oh, I forgot at the very start to thank Tool again, the open organization of lock pickers, uh, for giving me their slides. Um, so whoever made these slides uh, locked himself out of his trailer and opened the can of Guinness, made a shim, opened the padlock. Um, some padlocks have a dual latch, so you've got a latch on both sides. Um, if it's a normal spring latch, you can shim both sides and you can open it. But more expensive padlocks have this double ball mechanism that makes it shim proof. So it's a little tricky to see what's going on here, um, but what you can see is that the shackle has two cavities, on either, one on either side, that the, those ball bearings slot into. In the middle there, in between the two ball bearings, is a rotor, and the rotor also has two pieces cut out of it. So when it's locked, it's in the position where it is here, those balls cannot move inwards, and they're blocking the shackle on both sides. So even if you're using a shim to try and push them, they're not gonna move. They're being blocked by a solid metal thing. But when that thing in the middle rotates, when the key is used, then the balls can move inwards and the shackle can come out. Um, so here's some uh, sort of what, what the, the sort of catch on the shackle side looks like with different types of locks. So you've got that sort of, these sort of square and, um, uh, diagonal cutouts on the left uh, for a normal shackle and on the right that curved one to accept a, a double ball bearing release. Um, and so a nice expensive padlock like this uh, sh shows the mechanism right there um, and that you will not be able to shim. You have to pick that padlock. I'm not sure, I think, I don't know if we have double ball cutaways, but we have some real cutaway padlocks here um, that have been carefully milled, and you can see all the pin mechanisms, and you can see how the release mechanism works too, um, and whether or not you're going to be able to shim that padlock, you'll be able to see from the cutaway. Um, yeah, so people, I don't know, lock up, lock up their expensive things with these padlocks, not knowing that that's going to, that bike is safe for like, 10 to 20 seconds from someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, you can also decode the combination. Um, there's like, I, I can't remember, like 64,000 possible combinations, but there's tricks so you don't have to go through all of them. Um, so I'll just sort of quickly run through that method. Uh, it's a little bit involved, but it doesn't take too long. It'll take you like 15 minutes uh, if you have a lock that you have to do this to. So first of all, you pull on the shackle because when you're putting pressure on the shackle and you turn the combination dial, it'll sort of lock into place at certain, <laughs> certain points along the, along the dial. Um, this definitely works for these, for these master locks, um, but for different ones, there are slightly different techniques. So this was just the one for the most common type of combination padlock, but go, to, go online um, if you have a different one and just see what the method is. They pretty much all have um, decoding problems. So what you do is put that pressure on, start turning the dial, and find where the dial sort of clicks into place. And the dial will click into place at slightly different points depending on whether you're attract, at, uh, approaching that point from the left or from the right. So go at it from both sides, and then find the number that's in the middle of those two locking points. Uh, and write that down. So. Uh, if you're a real pro, like write down both sticking points and the one in the middle, but you can just write the one in the middle, uh, which is the average of those two numbers. And what you're going to end up with, uh, with this type of lock, is 12 sticking point numbers. Uh, and especially this is important if it's at a half point, you know, so if, you, um, if it sticks one way at, uh, like, 
uh, at six, and the, from the other side at five, then five and a half is your number. That's important to put, to put those half numbers in. And so what we're going to find next, the, the, the exploit that we're doing here on this lock is finding the third number of the combination. And we're looking for uh, the odd one out, or in English we use the term black sheep. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's the one that doesn't belong. So, for example, uh, well, and, and, well, looking at these numbers again, so the th we're looking for the one that doesn't belong, and the thing that doesn't belong about it is we're looking for one that's a whole number, and that, so not a fraction, and that doesn't have the same last digit as the others. So we look at numbers here, we can see we've got um, eight fractions, and four that end in a five. So there is no odd one out in that list. That means we got one wrong. So we're gonna go back, take a look. Uh, is this one really right? You know, double check here. Actually, this one should be a 23. So now we're in a good place here. So now we've got our list of numbers. We cross out our fractions and our ones that have the same last digit. And the one that's not a fraction and has the unique last digit, that's 23. So now, uh, we know that our third number is 23, and the last digit, is, which we call the magic number, is a 3. So now, uh, you can do it with a spreadsheet or something like that. Again, like I said, this is not like something that takes 20 seconds, like a shim. It takes 15 minutes or so, but we can see in this spreadsheet the third number in the combo is 23. We need to find the first and the second. We know our magic number is 3. Now we make a list of numbers starting from... Uh, one of them starting from the magic number, the other one starting from one, and we find every four from there. We add four to all those numbers. We make a list of every possible one that's four from the magic number, four from one, um, and then those, all of those ones underneath, that's our list of possible combinations. Um, and then we have to go through them. There's about 80 possible combinations. It's a lot better than running through 64,000. And in 15 minutes, you can you know, your expected number you have to try is in the middle, so you'll expect to have to try 40 combinations, and you have to sit, just have to sit there and do it. But it's better than going through 64,000 combinations. Um, there's uh, also these types of um, combination locks. Sometimes you can do these in a similar way. Sometimes you can pre uh, put pressure on the shackle and rotate the dials and find the one that's sticking. Um, and usually, you know, if it's a, if it's a really bad multi-dial, combi multi-wheel combination lock, you can just find the one that sticks and lock it and then do, the, do one, you know, each one in order and eventually open it. Otherwise, um, there are also tools that are available that let you reach in to the small crack between the wheel and the body and you can feel the gaps in there um, and uh, find, find the uh, places where it's should, be, should line up on the combination. Uh, I think one of those tools is called a sesame decoder. Um, all right. Next, this is something that's like very relevant to the people doing our workshop here because we have a bunch of these locks, uh, locks that are more or less designed to be pick resistant, right? Because obviously once people worked out you could pick locks, then there was an incentive to design locks that were harder to pick, uh, ideally impossible, but there are a few of those on the market. Um, one of the first ways to make it hard for people to pick locks is to just change the keyway. So if the keyway is very straight, very wide, it's easy to get picks in there, um, that's, that's, that's easy. So a, a more difficult keyway uh, keeps the keyway straight, but narrows it. So there's not as much room to get your picks in uh, or you can then, you know, make the keyway even thinny, thinner and curvier, or put lots and lots of crazy angles in them. Um, that's starting to get pretty difficult to get a pick in there. Uh, and then something like this, high security keyway, which has what's called wards. Uh, so wards is a term in, in locks that means something that blocks something. So um, I don't have slides on it, but very simple old keys, if you look like back hundreds of years ago, they're what's called warded keys. So they, those keys that are just a, a flat thing with just pieces cut out of them, those pieces lined up with wards inside the lock that would stop a flat piece of metal without the cutouts from turning. But when you have the right cutouts, you can put it in and turn it. That's what led to the term a skeleton key because you could just make a thin 
bar of metal with one piece right on the end and it would just bypass all the wards and just open the lock so it's like, that's, called, that's what a skeleton key is. Same thing here, these, these horizontal pieces of metal there are blocking something from coming in and moving up and down. So if you, if you find a lock like this, it's uh, pretty hard to get a pick into. Um, you can also get these pick resistant pins. So this is something we have a bunch of examples here uh, for you to play with. Uh, Norbert knows which ones, which locks have them in them. Um, but they're designed to make that whole picking process of finding the binding spot and lifting the pin and, and setting it to make that difficult, to make it basically the pin wants to set in the wrong place. So this is a very common type of pick resistant pin. It's called a spool pin. It's called that because it's the same shape as the spool that you would wind thread on, for example. Um, and so if you try to put tension on a lock like this, you can see that it binds immediately. As soon as you turn it, um, it's gonna jam up and you can't move that pin up and down with your pick anymore. So I think this is an animation. Yeah, so when you, when you try and push that up, it's already outside the um, place it needs to go and you can't move it up. But that doesn't mean we can't pick locks with spool pins in them. We just have to get a little bit, bit better at lock picking. So the usual way to do it um, is to sort of notice where the plug is before you put tension on it. Then you put your tension on it um, and move the pin up and then back it off a little bit on your tension to push it up above the shear line and then it'll set it in the right place. Uh, obviously that's pretty easy to show with one pin. If you've got a bunch of pins in a stack and only one or two of them are spool pins, you've got to kind of figure out which ones they are. Uh, it's not easy, that's the whole point, uh, but it's totally doable. Uh, a similar type of pin um, to a spool pin is a mushroom pin. It works basically the same way. Um, it binds at the same point. Um, actually, maybe Norbert knows, I don't really know what makes a mushroom pin better than a spool pin. I, I feel like it's harder to manufacture, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's just different, I guess. Um, one type of pin that's really difficult, uh, and we have some examples of that here too, is a serrated pin. I don't have an animation for it, but basically, you know, there's just lots of little uh, ridges on the side of the pin, so it'll bind no matter where it is vertically when you turn it, and after you put tension on a lock, you can't move that pin up anymore because it binds all the way along its length. Um, ASA, uh, which is now part of ASA Abloy, makes a lot of high security locks. So they have this special one called a sneaky pin, um, which has this little ridge in the center of it. Um, I don't know if we have a, yeah, so that um, binds halfway down the pin. So if you're like thinking, oh, this is a spool pin, I'm gonna pick this, all right, you know, you're gonna notice that bit there and be like, all right, I think that's the end, edge of the spool. I'm gonna move it up a little bit more and bind it, but actually you're just moving it up to the next level in the spool and you still won't be in the right place. Um, here's the uh, double mushroom. Again, I don't know why the double mushroom is better than a spool other than it just feels different. So if someone's used to picking spool locks, then maybe they'll have trouble with the double mushroom. Um, and in general, this, these kinds of things really ramp up the difficulty of picking the lock. So a high security padlock like this, uh, much, much more difficult to pick than your standard cheap padlock. Doesn't mean you can't pick them, but it's gonna take a lot more time and effort to do it. Um, this is something that a bunch of people asked me about on the first day, uh, which was I was excited to, uh, to tell them about, um, but uh, we only did the short presentation on the, on, the, on the first day, but this is um, a kind of attack called a bump attack, uh, and this is a way to kind of pick all of the pins of a lock at once. Um, you need a special key to do it. Uh, it's called a, called a bump key uh, and a little bit of skill. 
Um, but a lot of locks are vulnerable to this, and if you get it right, they will open instantly. Uh, so this makes use of um, physics, uh, the same way that uh, in a game of pool, um, or in that one of those Newton's cradle toys, you have all the balls hanging down and you drop one from the side. All the ones in the middle don't move, but the one at the end shoots out, right? You guys all seen a Newton's cradle? Um, billiards is the same way, so um, we shoot in the ball from one side and the three doesn't move at all, but the two shoots off in that image. And this has been something that's been known about for a long time, and you, you actually see it sometimes in the movies. Uh, not that you should get your lockpicking information from movies, because normally they don't know shit about lockpicking, but um, sometimes you see in like uh, spy movies and stuff, these guys will have this gun type thing, and they'll stick it in the lock, and they'll be like, chick, 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 and it'll open. Uh, that's called a pick gun, looks like this. Um, it's also called a snapping gun, and what that does, the um, One on the top, um, uh, well, they have these interchangeable snappers there. You can see these inter interchangeable things. But the one on the top is when it's in fixed. Um, you know, if you've loaded into the gun. And what that thing does is whack all the pins. And as you whack it, you put some tension on the lock uh, after each whack. And it's sort of an automatic thing. And it'll open when it slaps all the pins up. And also I'll show an animation of what's happening here. Um, Hopefully, yeah, there we go. So that little piece there is whacking all the bottom pins and that sharp force imp impulse is being transferred through the pins to the top pins and they're all jumping up at once over the shear line. So you can imagine what happens if you turn that lock at just the right moment, when all those top pins are up above the shear, it's gonna open. Um, there's, uh, there's a close up of what's going on. You're giving a short, sharp whack, and up all those pins go. So a bump key does basically the same thing. So what you do is you get a key that's made for that lock. So it fits that key where you can put it in. Get a blank key, cut all the biddings down to zero. So what you end up with is a key like this. It's got these little shark's teeth uh, ridges in between all the pins. And so this is one where uh, you're putting the key almost all the way in and then jamming it forward fast. And those ridges in between your deep cuts on the key are pushing up sharply those bottom pins and that's whacking the top ones above the line. They, this is called the pull method. I don't know why because it's still pushing them, but um, it's, it requires you to put the key in exactly this right amount. Um, that's uh, one key position too short. More commonly is this method where you take, a, um, take your bump key and you shave off what's called the shoulder of the key. So the shoulder of the key is what's closest to your hand where you're turning the key. Shave off a little bit of that so that there's room. When you put the key in the normal depth, there's still a little bit of room for it to move in. And then you get a little hammer and you whack the end of it and a fraction of a second later, you uh, turn, the, turn the plug and the lock will open. So I think this is an animation, yeah. So if you see someone doing bumping, unfortunately we don't have any bump keys here, but uh, they'll have a little metal hammer, usually on a flexible shaft, and they'll whack turn. And that's all the skill in bumping is just getting that timing right. Whack and then turn. It's like a fraction of a second apart to open the lock. Uh, and it works on lots and lots and lots of locks. So you can buy sets of bump keys and you'll get like a big key ring full of uh, zero cut uh, keys for all these different kinds of locks. Or you can go to your local locksmith and you can ask for a key blank and then you can go home and cut them all down to zero and shave a little bit off the shoulder and make your own bump keys. Um, you can definitely uh, damage locks by bumping them. So here's an example of one where the, the door frame is cracked. So just like, uh, just like we said on the first day, um, don't do this to other people's locks and don't do it to locks that you care about because you can break them. 
Uh, there are various bump countermeasures. When this, when this technique was uh, developed, it's, it was kind of weird because it had really been known for a long time because pick guns have been around for a long time. But um, suddenly bump keys became in vogue uh, at a certain point and then all these locks, even relatively high security locks, were vulnerable to bumping. And so the lock manufacturers had to do something about it. Um, so there are various countermeasures. This is one. So you can see here on that last pin, it's got a shoulder so it doesn't come down all the way. There's a gap between it and the bottom pin. And that means that you don't have that Newton's cradle physics working for you anymore. When you try to use your bump key, the bottom pin's going to fly up, but it's not going to have enough force when it gets there to push the top pin up. Um, you can also get these anti-bump driver pins. So these pins are much lighter than the regular top pins when you do a bump. Um, it's not going to have enough momentum to overcome the spring enough to get, get up above where it needs to get. So they look like this. Um, and I guess they cost like $9 if, if, you've got, if you get the dealer price from, um, if you register yourself as a locksmith, I guess. This is probably pretty American-centric, so I'm going to skip through this bit on locksmiths. But it's all about like uh, what you need to do um, to register as a locksmith. You, can get, you guys can figure out what your local regulations are. Uh, but once you, if you register as a locksmith, you have access to a lot more stuff because uh, there are a lot of places that won't sell you things unless they think you're a, a legit type of person. Um, the thing is with any of these picking methods, uh, with the exception, I don't have slides unfortunately, uh, but one exception is tubular lock picks, which are a lot of fun. Um, so you remember a lot of vending machines have these tubular locks. They're basically pin tumbler locks, but the pins are arranged in a circle from your point of view and you, your key, uh, oh, all right, Norbert has some, has some tubular picks, nice. Um, so the cool thing about tubular picks is that they are, uh, they, when you use them, at the end when it finally picks the lock, the tubular pick is in a state that you can pull it out and you can put it back in the lock and turn the lock anytime. It sort of saves the state of the lock because it's basically an impressioning method. Regular lock picking, um, you pick the lock, you open it, but if you close it again, you've got to pick it all over again. You don't, nothing saves the state. Um, impressioning is a way to use a lock to generate a key that opens that lock. So the tubular picks basically do that. Um, but you can do this with regular locks too, uh, regular pin tumbler locks. So you start off with a key blank. So that's what a, a key blank looks like before you cut the bidding into it. Um, and then you yourself cut it in um, slowly as you do the process. So what you're left with at the end is a working key for that lock. So here's how it works. You stick your blank key in, you're raising all the stacks. So, so if this was picking, we'd say we'd overlifted all of those bottom, all of those stacks so that the bottom pins are blocking the lock. And then you turn the key hard to make one of those pins bind. And then you jiggle the key around and wiggle it. And that causes that pin to rub on the key. So binding and wiggling. And then you pull your blank out and you look for scratch marks on your key blank. So you've got some here and there. And then you file it a little bit down at the places where it rubbed. And then you repeat the process. So in this one, pin stack four is still binding. Pin stack two is still binding when you wiggle. So we're gonna cut it down some more. You guys get the idea. Once you get to the right place, here, pin stack four is not binding anymore. When you turn it, it's not sticking, it's just turning, and it's not gonna make a mark. Uh, and new marks will appear at other places to show where some other pin stack is binding. Um, and so we don't, we don't file down there, we fall down here, and we keep going. Um, it's something that's very delicate. You need a feel for how much pressure to put on the thing, and then also take some time. Um, this one actually has a, uh, a mark. I don't know if you can see it on the slides. Anyone, anyone see uh, the mark on this key? 
Let me see if I can see it. Yeah. So pin stack number two, boom. So these guys uh, who do it, um, are, you know, you, you can do it like at a location, obviously, but uh, on the on the bench at one of these competitions, they'll have a magnifying glass and a light, looking for those marks, um, filing by hand, and with the key held in a nice little um, attachment there that lets you gives you gives you a little bit of leverage to put more um, put more pressure on the on the key, and eventually it'll open up, and what you have at the end is a key that works for that lock. Um, so this happens in competition. So here's, uh, let's see if the video will play. No, totally, totally works for me. Ah, there we go, it's working. Do we have sound? No. Okay, that's cool. Uh, well, the HDMI should have sound. Nah, just this. Um, but anyway, it, it's sort of more obvious what's happening when you've got sound because you can hear him filing, but he's like, every time, wiggling the, wiggling the key, um, looking for the mark. Just a couple of files each time. You only t want to take off um, a, a few thousandths of an inch or a few fractions of a millimeter off the key at that point. And this guy's obviously really good at it because it only takes me about a minute to impression this. There we go, opens it up. And once, once you're done, you have a key that always works. So congratulations to that dude. Um, another thing that you'll encounter with real locks um, is master keying. So master keying is the way that you can give different people access to a lock um, with uh, different sort of privilege levels. So it's named after if you've got a master key, if you want your building, if you want like the superintendent or uh, someone like that to have access to every door in the building, they've got a master key that opens all the locks, but other people have just keys that open one lock. So you know, in an apartment building, um, you only want people to be able to open their own apartment, but you want one guy to be able to open all the apartments if he's, uh, you know, the cleaners or whatever. Um, so how that works is you have um, a different type of pin in the stack. It's called a master pin, and they're usually very short and skinny compared to the other pins. But if you, so if you buy a lock pinning kit, uh, it'll come with all the pins that you need to create mastered key systems, and you'll get, um, top pins that are all the same height, bottom pins that vary so that you can uh, uh, set the key biddings for individual keys, and then these master pins. And so a master pin obviously just creates a dual shear line. So uh, and in that second pin there, it'll open at, a, at one bidding and then another one that's one or two biddings above that. It'll open at two places. So you can have some variability of the keys. Um, master keying, makes lock picking easier because now there are multiple shear lines, right? So if you're picking, you only have to pick, uh, the, in the mastered stacks, you can pick at either of those lines. Um, it also introduces a security vulnerability depending on how you do your mastering um, because you can, um, if you have access to a real key, you know, your legit key that opens your door, you can measure off all of, your, uh, all of your biddings and you can figure out where it's possible to have a mastering and what the possible master values are. And then you can um, start making keys and trying them out. And it actually doesn't take that many before you figure out how to get to the mastered ones. So here's, here's an example. Um, our original key cup depth is, is at, at an eight to open the lock. So if we think that there's a master in that master pin in that stack, we can get a, a blank key. We can cut it almost like our key, except for, for, for number two. Leave that uncut. We try it. The lock doesn't open. File it down a little bit. Still doesn't open. File it down a little more. Still doesn't open. Finally, it opens, and we we now know the height of that master pin because we knew what our original one was. We were originally four eight four two six. 
Now we know that 6426 works, so we know there's a two master pin in that. Uh, and you can repeat that for each pin stack that you think there's a, a master pin in, and you can reverse engineer the mastering of the lock. Um, that was uh, a paper by Matt, Matt Blaze in 2003. Here's a, another thing that's hopefully useful to people uh, at the level we're at now, which is just like, what, what, are, the, what are the different picks uh, and what do they do? Because there's a lot of lock picks that you can buy, and there's a lot of places you can buy them from. Um, there's, uh, you know, all these ones here. Um, I, Southord is a good one for people in the US. I don't know which one of these ship internationally. Um, someone told me yesterday that Sparrows, um, I can't see if they're on the slide or not. I don't think they are. Uh, will ship uh, free shipping internationally, apparently. So that might be a good place to look. Um, Southord has really good comb padlock picks. I just bought some of those um, a couple of weeks ago. What about DX? Sorry? DX. Uh, DX? Still extreme? Yeah. I never bought any from there, but I'm not surprised if they have them. I've bought stuff from there, bought lasers from there, but I never bought lockpicks from there. Yeah, there's like just lots of places on the internet that have them of varying quality. Um, if you're just starting out, you might not care. Um, Norbert has a set that he got, it's like a big set that he got from China for $10, or right, a 10 euro. Um, he can show you it. It's, it's not great, but you know, it's, Good, good place to get started. Um, so here's an example of a kit. You can see it's full of all kinds of different picks and tools. Um, the first thing that sort of differentiates different types of picks uh, is what metal they're made out of. So spring steel is a classic material. It's very resilient. Um, stainless uh, is nice too um, because it doesn't rust. Um, and then you, know, you can get really expensive titanium picks and stuff like that and, and probably other things too. Thickness is something to care about. Uh, different suppliers have different thicknesses and that's one of the drawbacks of Norbit's 10 euro Chinese pick set. The picks are very thick. Um, obviously a thinner one can get into more keyways. At a certain point, thin ones become you know, more flexible and sort of hard to deal with. So different manufacturers um, go with different amounts. And this is, a, you know, I apologize again, all in inches. But uh, the, the sort of, um, I guess, de facto standard uh, tool uses it, and also Southord and so on is this 0.02, um, 20 thousandths of an inch. So whatever that works out to be in millimeters. Okay, half a millimeter. I'm, I'm taking that as, uh, I'm accepting that without checking it in my head. Um, then there's this. Uh, You'll see manufacturers advertise standard versus Euro picks, um, which uh, on the top is standard and the bottom is Euro, and it's basically just the, the sort of thickness uh, and the angle of the shaft of the pick there. So I don't know. I'm not a good enough lock picker to care personally. Um, here's all the different sort of types of picks and what the categories and names are. Uh, so these ones we saw in the very first pin tumbler demo, uh, like animation, these are hooks, uh, which are for lifting individual pins. Um, and you can see all these different sort of sizes and angles. And they obviously uh, the, the, the vertical length is sh short, medium, long, and gonzo. Uh, and then whether the top of the hook is flat or round. So short hook, flat, short hook, round. Uh, tool says, you know, you'll usually see the short hook flat. Um, short hook round is useful. Uh, the Gonzo, the, uh, what was, what was this one? The Gonzo is awesome. They say, I don't have any Gonzos, so I don't know if they're awesome or not. And then they hate the long hook. Um, so, you know, the, this is what the experts say. I'm not, I'm not good enough to know. Although, um, I'll say that uh, a short or medium hook, for me, not being a super highly skilled pick, picker, they, they seem to work the most for me personally. Um, then we've got these uh, curves and hybrids um, that are you know, also for, for sort of reaching into um, a long or weird keyway. We've got our half diamonds um, or our various diamonds. So again, distinguished by, sides, uh, by size uh, and the angle of the diamond. And then also that weird double one at the bottom 
Um, so small, medium, and large, and then diamond head. Um, I like a medium diamond, so I'm in agreement with Tool here. Uh, the the, the double-sided diamond seems to be totally pointless because uh, you're not using the other side, and it means you can't flip it over and do pin stack counting, so I don't know what the point of that is. Um, you can also get these offset tools, so offset diamond, offset ball, and offset snake. Um, I, I've never used any of those, so I don't know what they're good for. Um, they, th this tool doesn't seem to be super enthusiastic about them either. Um, and then you can, instead of diamonds, you can get balls. Um, so single ball, snowman, half snowman, and half ball. Um, so I rarely see any of these except the snowman. So I've, I've got snowman picks in a couple of my kits, but I also uh, basically never use them. Um, so I don't really know what they're good for. Uh, Norbert, do you ever use, use ball picks? Okay, so yeah, Norbert says um, you can rake with them if the pins are not are not super easy to, to push. Um, speaking of rakes, these are uh, the raking tools, and this is where things get really crazy um, because there's just all kinds of rakes. So you got your classic snake, um, aka sn uh, C rake, and then these like different like fractional snakes, double snakes, stretch snakes, uh, and this batarang tool uh, S-rake down the bottom, um, which you just got to watch out for that bottom one because you can see there's like a, the, the metal gets pretty thin um, and you can break them off in the lock. And we actually had that happen um, either yesterday or the day before. Um, and that's annoying because not only have you broken your pick, but also you've got a piece of a pick stuck in the lock and it can be hard to get out. You might have to completely disassemble the lock to, to get that piece of metal out. Um, I really like these guys. Um, so it's the difference uh, between like raking uh, and lifting or lift raking. So with the raking tool, you're moving it in and out of the lock, maybe changing the angle up a little bit um, as you do it. With these tools, you can rake back and forth and you can also sort of jiggle it up and down and back and forward. So these guys are called jagged lifters um, and they come in also totally different, lots of different varieties. I usually use a long rake. Uh, I, I have a lot of success with those. They, they work well on, um, you know, padlocks with large numbers of pins and stuff like that. Like there's a, I, I picked a bunch of padlocks last year that I couldn't get with any other picks, but I was, I could only open them with an L rake for whatever reason. Maybe because I'm not that great of a lock picker, but uh, it was the one that worked for me anyway. Um, and then these guys, I've, I've also never used them, but um, they call it a king and a queen pick. Uh, again, if, it, if, if, if Norbert, if you have any comment on those. Um, now this is something that like, this, these came along a few years ago and uh, people really, really like them. Um, they're, they're called Bogota. Um, I, I've, I've always heard them, heard them called Bogota rakes, but um, they look like this. Uh, some guy called Raimondo invented them, and they're variants on a kind of a tool that's called a jiggler. So a jiggler is sort of like, again, in between lifting and raking. So you got your raking in and out, you got your lifting forwards and back, uh, and then you've got this kind of jiggle. You put it in and you're like just kind of wiggling everything around. Um, so here they are, Bogota, uh, with three humps and a single hump. Um, and uh, there's the link if you want to go check out those. Um, Southord also makes a set of pin tumbler jigglers that's like, they look like little keys, but they have just these crazy profiles on them and you get like a key ring full of them. And it takes some it takes some practice, so I'm told, but you can often get open some, uh, some locks that you otherwise are not able to pick. Um, and then, so what time are we at? So we've been, we've been doing this for like about an hour, so what's left in this presentation, if you guys want to see it, um, is 
forensics um, of lock picking. So basically how the tools damage the locks. Um, and then just, are people interested in that? Show of hands, who wants to see like some like damaged locks from picking? All right, we'll, we'll do it. Um, so the, um, the way, the way that we can look at a lock and we can see if it's been picked uh, relies on the fact that keys do basically the same thing every time you put them in a lock and turner. They touch the same places, they're pretty specific. And then also, um, when pins are manufactured, they're manufactured with some little tiny, uh, tiny lathe or something. They have, they, some tool cuts them out the way that they're cut out. And so they have these manufacturing tool marks on them. We can see what a new pin should look like with these tiny little tooling ridges. And it's also kind of predictable how they will eventually, those, those tool marks will get removed by normal usage on the lock. So here's like what a pin looks like up to 250 uses, worn down a little bit, 1500 uses, 5000 uses. So it's just getting smoothed off, right? It's just like we're, we're sanding that pin down over thousands of actual key unlockings of the lock. Um, similarly, the plug, when you turn the plug, the driver pins are being pressed down on the plug by those springs. So when you turn that plug, the, the top pins with spring pressure are scraping along the plug. So after multiple uses, you start to see these scraping marks that are, you know, sort of very predictable in how they look. Picks, on the other hand, are touching parts of the pins that the keys don't touch, like on the back side. When you push the, push the key in, it's, it's running across the front side, but it's not touching the back. So we can look at our pins and say like, oh, is this normal wear and tear, or is there evidence that someone's been using a picking tool on the lock? Something, something like that, that we just, we wouldn't expect to see a, a cut like that um, from just a key moving across it, across the bottom of it. Um, so here's some examples of uh, lifting pick tool marks on the bottom of a pin. Um, so it's been you know, pushing up on it, uh, raking across, you're going to make these scratches that are sort of all the way across the pin, um, or mixed picking styles. And eventually, this is, this is why uh, people say don't pick locks that you care about, because uh, eventually you'll really mess them up. Um, and your pins will, will look like this, which looks, you know, I don't have the slide right next to it, but it obviously looks very different to what we saw from like 5,000 key usages. And so even people who are, who are really good um, at picking leaf marks on the pins. Um, snapper guns, leaf marks too. So once again, like the bumping. Um, so you're whacking into a soft piece of metal with a hard piece of metal. The snapper on the gun is gonna be made out of a hard spring steel and the pins are brass. Um, so you get these, uh, you know, you can see where the, the metal has been pushed out of the way and is, is even cupping up into little ridges. Um, some people, all right, myself included, I, I, I never know where the end of the lock is. So I always poke in too deep and uh, scratch the back, of the, the back of the lock. So if you, if, you, if you disassemble your lock and you see that there's some marks up there, then you know someone's been trying to pick it. Um, or all the way in, if there's a tail cap and someone's jammed, jammed a pick in there and scratched the back. Um, you can see the marks of tension tools in the keyway, just like we said at the beginning, like about pinching the keyway. So there's some, some scrapes uh, at the, at the bottle, bottom of the keyway from the tension tool. And then if someone's been like jamming in a screwdriver or something like that to try and open the lock, you can see some like real big nasty marks on the pin where they've, especially that front, the front pin where they've, someone's jammed a screwdriver in. So you can, you can see whether someone's been trying to illicitly access your stuff. Uh, bump keys, obviously you're gonna leave marks too, just like a snap a gun. So um, there's a, a little divot from a bump key um, over there. So just like, you know, if someone had hit it with a hammer, because that's basically what they're doing. They're hitting the key with a hammer and then the key is hitting that. So some little stuff there. Uh, 
oh, this is worth this is worth showing, um, especially if you guys want to take a snapshot. Um, here are some books and videos and websites. Um, the first uh, first book there is also the guy that originally made these slides. Um, he's he's a pretty famous tool uh, person. And then, of course, the top website too is the, the tool.us website. Tool, the open organization of lock pickers, and they run all kinds of contests and stuff. So, take a snapshot of that. Um, this is where they have local tool chapters in the US, uh, which is not any help to anyone here, but uh, they also have lots of chapters in Europe, tons of tool people in Europe. So, um, I think the main tool Europe site is tool.nl. So, go there to see what people. Um, uh, what people are around you to, to interact with. Um, some quick things about the legal questions. Uh, basically, stuff varies a lot depending on jurisdiction. Um, so, some places will ship through the mail and some won't. So, you just got to check whether you know what people require to ship to you. Um, a lot of times, if you go to a real like mail order is usually a lot easier than going to a real locksmith, right? Because a real locksmith may, you know, say, "Oh, well." I need to see some credentials before I'm going to give you this or whatever. Like, um, especially if you want key blanks. Like most normal people have no use for a key blank. So when you go to a locksmith and say, "Hey, I need a blank for this like particular lock," they often be like, "Well, well yeah, what do you need that for?" Uh, so it's just easier to mail order. Um, and then some places have like actual legislation against um, possession and use of lock picks. The only place that I've ever been hassled for. Um, Having my lock picks, I'm embarrassed to say, was in Australia. Um, I've been hassled multiple times uh, at airports there, but never anywhere else. Um, so, and and there are rules in Australia uh, about possession, unless you're a locksmith. So, um, I just made myself a business card that said I was a locksmith because uh, it's not like you have like a, you know, a police badge or anything. So. Uh, I haven't had to use it yet. I haven't been hassled since I made that, but I'm hoping that will be will be enough to just stop being yelled at. I'm sure it will be. Um, most places, the rule is you can't have these while committing an illegal act. So if you're carrying lockpicks, try not to break other laws, uh, or else you might get in trouble. Um, just for reference, again, I don't have Europe here, unfortunately, but this is sort of the rules um, in the United States. So mostly. Things are just, just cool, but there's a few states where things are more restricted. So that's probably the case in Europe too, I would imagine. Um, another question people have a lot is like, hey, where do I get locks from uh, to practice picking on? Because I don't want to pick on my house lock because I'm going to damage it. Um, so get used stuff for free is the best way to do it. Um, if you, if you want to buy them, you can get them on the hardware stores, eBay, stuff like that. The, um, the cutaway and acrylic locks, Like these guys, I, I guess there's now like a big, uh, a big industry in training locksmiths that the Chinese market has noticed because suddenly these things got really cheap. Um, I just bought some two weeks ago and I was amazed. Like uh, on Amazon, they, you know, I could get a, a real cutaway padlock and two different kinds of acrylic uh, visible locks for like $30 on Amazon. And I'm sure it's just coming from China. Um, and so you can get different kinds. These are, these are really nice because you can see what's going on. The only thing is they're much easier to pick than a real lock because the plastic body is soft and it's just a lot more uh, give to things and things. The, the pins just bind much easier. These, this is a real legit padlock that they've mill, milled into. So this is much more like picking a real lock. Um, but you also get to see what's going on. So you can get those pretty inexpensively. Um, and uh, then also, if you go to the tool website, they sell those ones down the bottom that are all uh, custom or like progressively pinned practice locks. So they start off being super, super simple. They get more and more difficult. Then they also make ones with security pins so that you can get some practice picking uh, security pin locks. Um, real world security, this is like a cautionary tale that's close to my heart because um, I uh, had some stuff stolen where I could have, you know, and I'd, I'd custom pinned my locks and made them really difficult to pick, but the people just like jimmied my door and broke it open. And I could have just had a $10 deadbolt and I would have actually been safe. So, you know, 
This is how you're more likely to lose your stuff in the real world than from lock picking. Uh, someone's just going to like reach in through a half open window with some kind of defeat tool um, or something like that and climb into your place or else they're just going to throw a brick through the window, right? And, and just steal your shit. So um, this stuff, you know, it's, it's really easy for us as nerds to get super focused on like the, the fine detail and having that lock be awesome and hard to pick. But you got to also remember that someone's just going to come along. Uh, it's not going to be with like these picks. It's going to be with like bolt cutters and a crowbar and they're just going to smash open your door. So don't put a hundred dollar lock in a $10 door. Um, make sure your doors are strong, you know, uh, check your windows, make sure that there's uh, you know, some sort of barrier to someone just throwing a brick through. Uh, when, my, when my place got broken into, um, they, they had to go through two, uh, two stages of security. So one, they climbed up to the second floor on a neighboring building um, and then put a plank over and came through the window. Um, we didn't have bars on the window. Um, and then once they were in, all the doors were locked, but then they just like got tools and just broke the doors open. So if we had put bars on the window on the second floor and uh, a deadbolt, that would have been way better than like making sure our locks were hard to pick. Uh, so guard against the, the quick and dirty attacks. Um, and so people think lock pickers are shady, but we're all of the people that we are here, um, young and old, men and women, we like doing things. Um, and I'm just skipping forward to the final tool slide. So once again, thank them very much for being super generous. Tool Boston especially hooked me up with these slides uh, and uh, um, are also really fun people to hang out with. They taught me how to, how to use tubular picks. So big shout out to Tool and especially Tool Boston. And that's where you go to find more info. Thank you.